on January 27, 2019, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, one of the world's leading paranormal investigators, did one of her last on-camera interviews for our feature film, The Bigfoot Alien Connection Revealed. Here is the interview in full. You had your own Bigfoot experience, if I understand correctly. Tell us about it. I've been interested in Sasquatch, Bigfoot, for many years, and especially the interrelationship between the appearance of Sasquatch and other paranormal phenomena and UFO phenomena as well. So uh, I have gone out in various states with uh, other Bigfoot researchers to uh, go into the field, and I've interviewed many people about their experiences. These are primarily in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and also Washington State, because I do travel out to the West Coast every year. I grew up in Washington. Washington State. Uh, most of the time, uh, my most dramatic experiences would be hearing wood knocks on nighttime investigations. But two summers ago, I went out into uh, an area in Washington State that's considered to be very active with uh, Bigfoot. And I went with two investigators who took me to some of the private locations where they had had some very dramatic experiences. And as we were walking along on the trails, uh, I became aware of something following us. And if I turned around fast enough, I could catch a glimpse of something big and brown uh, on the trail behind us, and it would vanish very quickly. I do believe that Bigfoot is interdimensional and that they have paraphysical capabilities, such as a sudden disappearance and cloaking themselves. They can make themselves invisible if they want. But I was with two researchers who said they'd had frequent interactions, and uh, it, it was like they had almost gotten permission to bring me along into some of their private areas. So that continued for the length of the trail. This uh, feeling of being followed and then turning around very quickly and catching uh, a very fast glimpse of something. So one of the areas that we went to was, it was like a wooded glen. We were deep into woods at that point. And this was like a little glen area. And in other countries, it would have been called like a fairy glen. You know, it had a little water in it and a lot of mossy trees. And uh, I was told by the two researchers that uh, this was uh, one of the inner sanctums of uh, the Bigfoot who uh, populated the area and uh, was very private and that uh, they, they often didn't like people coming into this area. But they wanted me to see it. Well, as soon as we entered this area, uh, the wood knocking started. And uh, there was nothing around us. We were the only people around. There was nothing visible to account for the sound of something banging against tree trunks. And this noise was very close to us, and it got very loud, and it continued uh, until we departed the area. And their interpretation of that was that um, it was their way, the, uh, the way of the Bigfoot, uh, of, of letting us know that uh, they knew we were there, and uh, they didn't want us to stay very long. And then on the trail back, uh, it was the same presence uh, of the sense of being followed and turning around very quickly and catching a glimpse of something. Well, we meditated for a while in another area uh, that uh, they described to me as a portal area and uh, that they had had sometimes manifestations in that area, but uh, we did not have any success that evening with a manifestation. Uh, now, I continue to be in touch with the researchers. One wishes to remain uh, private because of uh, his, what he describes as job sensitivities, uh, but uh, in uh, our trip uh, upcoming for Washington State. Uh, we're going out with them to some other areas where uh, some more dramatic activity has taken place and we'll be camping overnight. Uh, I've always believed in the paraphysical nature of Bigfoot and the more evidence I have collected from individuals who've had all kinds of experiences, whether it's just been wood knocking or something more uh, dramatic like a physical creature uh, in front of them, uh, the phenomena associated with their manifestations defies natural explanation. And I think that we must turn to paraphysical or interdimensional considerations if we're going to fully understand uh, their presence on Earth and their interactions with humans. Can you expand upon the paraphysical and interdimensional aspects of Bigfoot? 
The characteristics that are associated with the paraphysical nature of Bigfoot include telepathic communication, people who have had especially multiple close encounters, and a lot of these would be individuals who spend a lot of time in the woods, like people who are hunting, fishing, camping, or maybe they live in remote areas. Uh, they feel that they have telepathic communication with these, these beings and that they are intelligent, maybe even superior to human beings. And uh, many of these messages are uh, benign uh, or friendly. There, there are people who have had uh, more aggressive ex encounters where um, the Sasquatch is, is a little more hostile and maybe it's because they feel that their territory has been intruded upon. So we have telepathy. We have uh, what would be called as bilocation or rapid transport. And that's the ability to be here and then suddenly there without visual means of getting there. Uh, that has been described on many occasions where uh, people will see a being like in front of them and then suddenly it's behind them and they don't see it go behind them. How did it get there? It's just suddenly there uh, without benefit of walking or running. Um, there are uh, other sightings, for example, where uh, a Bigfoot is seen literally gliding over the surface of something, especially snow. They're not really walking, they're more gliding. Or they're walking over something like crusted snow and not leaving any footprints. We have footprints that seem to drop from outer space. Uh, they, they come from nowhere and they go nowhere. It's like suddenly it's there, suddenly it's not. Uh, if, if a Bigfoot seems to want to be material and tangible, it seems to have the ability to do that and then to turn itself into something intangible as though it's going through uh, an interdimensional doorway. Um, we have the UFO connection, that there are many hotspot areas where there are frequent sightings of Bigfoot. And we also have frequent sightings, um, major sightings of UFO activity, craft sightings or landed craft or some sort of communication with non-human intelligent beings associated with the craft. There have been cases where people have seen holes open up in the sky and beings like a Sasquatch seem to emerge from these holes as though they're coming through an interdimensional doorway. So we have those aspects. Uh, we have supernormal strength. Now, of course, we're dealing with a large creature. Uh, they're described as usually six to eight feet tall. They're big, so of course they're going to have a lot more strength than a human being. But they exhibit even strength that we could not associate with, uh, for example, large apes on the planet. They're capable of snapping uh, rather sizable uh, tree branches or even small tree trunks very easily and uh, they will hurl large rocks, even small, what you would call small boulders at people uh, if they're trying to get their attention or get them uh, to leave an area. Uh, these are not things that we associate with earth creatures. Uh, when, when people try and describe uh, Bigfoot as, well, this is just some unknown uh, holdover species from earlier times that's still on the planet and still living in remote areas, these other explanations don't fit in. How many animals can we think of who can do these things? None of them. And yet they are uh, frequently associated with, uh, with Bigfoot experiences. What do you want to say to Bigfoot investigators who were convinced the Bigfoot is only a flesh and blood creature? What I have to say to the community of Bigfoot researchers is the evidence is piling up that uh, there is something paraphysical about Bigfoot. You cannot ignore the evidence uh, in encounters all over the world that point to a paraphysical nature of Bigfoot. And so, well, uh, we certainly need to consider all possible explanations until we have something definitive uh, to just dismiss the interdimensional uh, aspects of Bigfoot out of hand uh, does a disservice to the research in the community at large because we need to gather all the evidence we can and evaluate it if we're going to come to uh, a meaningful understanding of it and perhaps even advance ourselves to the point where we begin to have uh, more communication with these beings. I think they regard human beings with a lot of distrust. 
there are some of them that, that um, seem to bond with human beings and have frequent interactions with them, but so many of the others, and for good reason, uh, seem to be very leery of human beings and our unpredictability and even our, our violent ways. Shows like uh, killing Bigfoot and let's go trap a Bigfoot and let's go bag a Bigfoot. These are the wrong approaches to take with these intelligent beings. They are clearly intelligent. They are capable of interacting with, with human beings on many different levels. Let's grow up. One of your areas of expertise is alien contact experiences of all kinds. We'd like to hear more about what you have discovered. Contact experiences of all kinds have interested me for uh, a good many years in my career, and I started full-time in these fields in 1983. From the get-go, I saw interrelationships between um, cryptids, uh, paranormal activity, UFO activity, uh, even metaphysical and spiritual activity. There's there, Everything is intercorrected by the proverbial six degrees or less than separation. And contact experiences do not need to be physical. They can be of a paraphysical nature. And this information now is coming out in the, in the uh, UFO community. We've had um, an emphasis on the abduction end of the spectrum, that uh, when ufologists uh, started turning their attention from strictly the nuts and bolts looking for crash craft and physical evidence to uh, contact experiences, it was the abduction end of the spectrum that got a lot of attention. And these are primarily negative experiences where people are forcibly taken from their homes, usually during sleep, and taken aboard a craft or to some other area and uh, probed medically. Maybe they've had genetic material removed. We've had people have described uh, participating in, in breeding programs. And now new information is coming to light. And I think it's been there all along. It's just that we haven't found it until recently. That uh, there are other kinds of contact experiences going on that people associate with aliens or extraterrestrials. And for lack of a better term, I think we need to call them non-human intelligent beings because we really don't know what they are or where they're from. They could be interdimensional from a parallel universe, not from another world far off in space. And a lot of these contact experiences take place in uh, what would be called a matrix reality. That is... And the contactee is uh, suddenly transported to uh, kind of a liminal between world, um, which some would describe as sounding like the astral plane, which is neither here on Earth nor somewhere else like a craft per se, uh, where they are having some sort of interaction with an intelligence, which they may or may not see. But there is telepathic communication. There is a sense of a presence. There is uh, usually some information imparted, but uh, we don't seem to get much evidence that um, these beings are uh, specifically here to warn us, help us, enlighten us, give us technology, give us medical information, they're, but they're here to have some sort of interaction with us that awakens something in our consciousness and expands it in uh, profound ways. And uh, what, what has come forward now in the contactee literature, and I've interviewed many subjects myself, is that they experience a range of physical and psycho-spiritual changes that conform with what we see uh, in the near-death experience uh, literature, people who've had sudden transport to the edge of heaven and come back, and also in the spiritual literature, people who have studied spiritual paths and meditated and worked on enlightenment for many years, uh, also experiencing physical changes in the body and the awakening of expanded consciousness, of healing ability that comes out of the hands, um, of uh, psychic changes, uh, more telepathic, more precognitive, more clairsentient, clairaudient. Uh, and that these are consistent with um, uh, the enlightenment process that human beings have experienced and described for many centuries. And it's now happening in this fishbowl of uh, the UFO contactee. So one of the things that I have uh, 
sought to, to research in, in my own work is that how do these experiences compare with uh, a historical perspective of transformation of people through some kind of contact. If we look at the contactee literature, we have people uh, talking about fairies, about angels, about spiritual masters, religious figures, coming into contact with them and having suddenly an explosion of change in their consciousness and, and even in the body. Uh, and now it's happening in the UFO arena. Uh, so is it just that we've transposed this process to uh, a technology and a language that appeals to us now? Um, people are not talking about fairies the way um, people uh, talked about some of these same things hundreds of years ago. Um, so maybe just the clothing of the experience has changed to suit our modern age, but the process seems to remain fairly consistent throughout the ages and it results in the same sort of thing. Transformation of consciousness which affects the body, affects how we think, how we interact with each other, and a awakening of what in spiritual terms would be called superpowers. What do you want to say to people who only believe in alien craft type contacts? The evidence of our uh, sightings of uh, mystery lights in the sky and craft, landed craft, our experiences uh, being taken aboard craft, uh, clearly point to the need to expand our definition of what it is that is uh, in our skies. Uh, it may not be physical craft. Uh, the, the nuts and bolts approach to, uh, to UFOs may be one aspect of the entire phenomenon, but there's a paraphysical nature to that as well. These, uh, these may not be craft in the human sense. They may be energy vehicles of some sort that appear to us in the form of craft. Th these may be the reasons why they have the capability of unusual maneuvers, sudden appearances, disappearances, uh, extraordinary characteristics that uh, uh, are unknown to terrestrial craft. The term UAP actually may be more appropriate than UFO, unidentified aerial phenomena, uh, rather than object, because these may be energy forms that we're dealing with and not physical objects. You said you've had your own awakening spiritual experiences. Can you relate these kinds of spiritual experiences to the kinds of alien contact encounters, including Bigfoot, that are happening right now? I have had my own experiences of a profound spiritual nature and uh, I've been interested in, in these topics from a young age and as I got older I delved into more and more areas. I became very interested in spiritual paths when uh, I reached adulthood and uh, I got involved in Zen Buddhism, I got involved in yoga and meditation, I took training in energy healing. And uh, all of these things work on uh, the psychic faculties that uh, when you start bringing high level energy into the body, it's going to affect your, your innate natural dormant psychic faculties. And uh, these are involved in spiritual transformation. So I had a few experiences of what would be called a kundalini awakening in, in the yoga path. Um, the kundalini energy being the serpent power, which in Eastern mysticism is a force that is born in all of us and uh, it lies coiled up like a serpent at the base of the spine and if we work on our spiritual consciousness this energy starts to uncoil and it moves up the spinal column through the chakras and it activates all of the chakra centers until it gets to the crown chakra and that's the place of enlightenment where you you might have uh, an explosion of cosmic consciousness or God consciousness and these sorts of experiences can happen through many ways. Uh, we can have a trauma, like an accident or a near-death experience that will awaken this. We can do it through spiritual study and training, such as I did early in my life, uh, through uh, a remarkable contact experience, like a being we think is an ET. There are a lot of ways to awaken, the, awaken this very suddenly. And if, if it happens too suddenly, uh, the body is flooded with a lot of energy that overwhelms it. And uh, the very first kundalini awakening I had uh, was, uh, it, it 
I, I call it a, a smaller kundalini awakening because it didn't derail me uh, from my life, but um, it, it feels like there's a lot of electricity in the body and you're just kind of wired, very wired all the time. And uh, you can be nervous and jittery, not sleep very well. Uh, the world around you starts looking differently. It's, it's like your perspective shifts. And uh, people may see auras around other people. They might have more frequent contact with, with uh, beings and presences. Um, they might uh, feel that they're in contact, uh, a, a greater awareness of God consciousness or uh, their place in the great cosmic scheme of things. Now, uh, if, if the energy is awakened too suddenly, it usually will settle down over time. And uh, that's what happened to me, that um, I just took a break from doing a lot of my spiritual work and, and uh, training. And um, you make some diet changes, like if you've been a vegetarian, you want to add a little meat to your diet, it's very grounding. And eventually that energy settles down and it becomes integrated. Uh, and it becomes integrated in a way that a person starts thinking of themselves differently in terms of the I am consciousness. Who are we as souls? Who are we on our path of life? How, how do we relate to the greater cosmic whole of things? Individuals start seeing themselves very differently. One of the biggest changes is um, people feel like their heart center opens up more and that they have more compassion, more sensitivity for others. The importance of the material world becomes less to them than it was before. If they were very ambitious and striving, they had to get this, they had to get that. Uh, those sorts of things start to become less important to them than being a better person, being a better soul. Uh, so it's not like that's abandoned, but it just takes a different place of priority in someone's life. Um, now, I've had a number of, of um, kundalini awakenings like that as I've gone through different uh, processes in life. And uh, they have definitely changed my perspective on things and in terms of uh, what I'm able to perceive, um, how, how my understanding of the world and my place in it and my place in the cosmic scheme of things um, changes. And um, I, I think that's what's happening now in the UFO contactee arena. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is that a lot of these people who are having significant uh, transformation changes like that are not people who've what we would call have been on the traditional spiritual path. They've just been ordinary people. Uh, and maybe they have a spiritual consciousness of, of some underpinning, but they haven't been pursuing it like, uh, uh, you know, they're on a path of enlightenment. And there seems to be something now about contact itself, which is uh, opening the door to things that it took um, other people many, many years to experience. So the question is, is humanity now, collectively, at a level where we're ready for this kind of, of uh, quicker change? We must be, or we wouldn't be having these experiences. But they still have to be integrated. For the individual to make meaning of them, they have to be integrated holistically on all levels of your being, physical, mental, spiritual, uh, and emotional. Uh, and they have to become part of who a person is. Uh, and that takes a, a bit of time. So uh, one of the things now that's lacking for the contactee community is where are the resources to help these people do the integration? We have therapists, of course, who help people with their abduction experiences. Uh, we do have an increasing number of psychotherapists who uh, are at least aware of these things, even if they don't fit the prevailing medical paradigm, they're at least aware of them. Uh, and so they're not going to dismiss them out of hand if someone comes to them for, for help dealing with all of this. But uh, we, we do need to acknowledge as a society that major changes are happening to people in the population that um, require some sort of integration so that um, they can benefit from, from the experiences that they're having. What does it all mean that we're having these alien contacts?
there are profound implications for what's happening. Now, it, it's clear from the evidence and from anecdotal testimony in the literature through the ages that human beings have always been in contact with something not human, uh, whether we've called it the gods or religious figures or visitors from other worlds, angels, um, earth-oriented spirits. Uh, we have been in contact throughout our entire history. Uh, and the implications are very important today for a number of, of reasons. One, we have now uh, tech consciousness, uh, which means we are united mentally and through consciousness and emotionally in ways that human beings have never been united in the past. Consider that even a century ago, how long it took news to travel from one place to another. An event would be long over with by the time people would find out about it and be able to absorb the impact of it. And now those things happen instantly thanks to the internet. So we have the capability of uniting our consciousness in very powerful ways. And one of the main tenets of all mystical and spiritu spiritual traditions is that thought creates reality. What we think, we become. What we think comes into being. Uh, now, not everything we think comes into being or the world would be very different because a lot of our thoughts just go spinning off into space without um, being capable of manifesting. And that's because we don't organize our power enough. If we focus our internal power, our thought power, our intention, our will, our sovereignty, our, our right to self-determination, uh, we have a powerful cosmic force that is capable of changing material, the material world. This has been demonstrated in uh, things like transcendental meditation experiments. In years past, there have been uh, experiments organized uh, with large groups of meditators to see if things like weather could be affected or acts, you know, normal accident rates, hospital emergencies, things like that. And uh, the evidence is what science would call on the soft side because it's very hard to get a control group for that sort of thing. Uh, but the evidence indicates that the more we unite our thought and our intention, uh, the more power we have, and that is a power that, um, if you put it in the hands of the people, um, I can see where there would be forces and influences that would not want masses of human beings to be able to govern the way things happen on the planet. Uh, and. So what contact is doing is awakening a lot of these awarenesses that people are discovering their internal power and uh, their ability to do things beyond the ordinary that were not available to them before. I believe that there are many agendas uh, afoot with our contact with what we're calling alien or extraterrestrial. And uh, I think the term extraterrestrial is way too limiting because it implies a being from off world, another world coming somehow uh, through space. And so all the explanations for the extraterrestrial hypothesis, how, how can beings from a distant world get here? Does it have to be through a wormhole or what? Uh, none of those may apply because uh, we might be dealing with things that are more interdimensional. I do believe that Earth is uh, in a stacked uh, interdimensional reality, that we have other dimensions very close to Earth, some of them very similar to our reality, some very different, and that a lot of our experiences with these beings, whether they're angels, fairies, uh, demonic entities, aliens, uh, unknown beings, they're coming from these interdimensional areas uh, and, and perhaps not from uh, far distant planets. And uh, they have the capability of being both physical and non-physical. Uh, and these may be characteristics that enable them to go through doorways, these portal areas. The planet is full of portals. These are areas that seem to be uh, energized in certain ways that um, have consistent phenomena going on in them and, and experiences that people have in these areas. And the biggest portal of all is human consciousness, and that's what's emerging now through tech consciousness. Well, now we have the emerging 
uh, positive end of contact experience that's come out through surveys and interviews with contactees. But I believe that uh, we can't paint things in a white or black way, and that's kind of a human tendency. It's, it's like, well, they're all here to help us. Now they're all here to enslave us. Uh, and I think there's a mix of things going on. Uh, I believe that there are beings that are kindly disposed to human um, beings and may want to offer us some kind of assistance. We have to do the work ourselves. I don't think they're going to do it for us. But I also believe that there are hostile beings because we have many hostile experiences where there are some sort of uh, entities or energy forms that want to take something from us, specifically the life force energy. And so are they here to harvest us in some way? Are, are they looking for earth resources? But their focus is on us, not on the earth. So there's uh, something about human energy um, and the energy that we generate that seems to be very appealing uh, to beings that they want that from us and their intent is to get it from us. Uh, we're a lesser life form to them. Uh, I believe that we have a mix of these agendas going on. We always have. And that the stakes are higher than ever because as, as we come into this ownership of our power, which we've never had before in a collective way, in a mass global way, as we come into the ownership of our power, we have the capability to, uh, to direct that power uh, in, in many ways. And are we going to inadvertently give it away? Or are we going to take it and use it in positive ways? That's what's at stake.